welcome to Furious Driving and today I am out on the road in one of, well, the shortest lived Wolseleys of whatever, in fact it is the shortest lived Wolsey ever and it's the last Wolsey ever known sometimes as the 1822, sometimes as the Princess, well that's not correct, but more often than not, just as the Wedge, this is the glorious swan song for a once illustrious brand. Now here's a quick word from our sponsor while you go and hit like and subscribe. Now please do hit like and subscribe. We're trying to get this channel up to 100,000 subscribers so we can go and take even more interesting, weird, unusual, different and unseen cars for drives and bring them to the public's attention. So hit that button and we can make it our mission possible. And, and we'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So yes, this is the Wolseley 1822, the Wedge, the Princess, the car technically with no name, because this is a car which as you look around it, you won't find any name badging anywhere, just the word Wolseley. The other cars were known as the 1822 initially, but that was taken off fairly early on. By the time the car was revealed officially at the London Motor Show, they changed the name as far as the public were concerned from the 1822 up to Princess. 1822, of course, referred to the two engine sizes that were available across the range. So it's never the correct name for the Wolsey anyway, because this only came with the six cylinder 2200. So this, the Wolsey Wedge, does have two slightly dubious honors in its name. Firstly, it's the shortest production run of any Wolsey of any ever at all, starting when the car went on sale in March 1975 and ending when the brand was were deleted in September 1975. So barely six months on sale and then the brand was dead. So at the stroke of a pen, this was not only the shortest production run of any Wolseley, it was also the last car ever to wear that famous badge. But before we get too far into this video, I just want to take a moment to say I know it is spelt Woolasilly, but you don't pronounce it Woolasilly, just say Wolseley. And if I'm saying Wolseley too quickly for you, please don't type a comment because I know how it's meant to be said. It's just not a very easy word to say, but whenever I say Woolasilly too quickly, people write a comment. So, so don't, don't, don't write a comment. Thank you. Now, you may have noticed this car is called The Wedge, and it's called that for a very good reason, because this is very typical of Harris Mann's handiwork. Harris Mann was the guy behind the TR7, and of course, the Allegro. But in this case, and very much like the TR7, he managed to get this thing through the various corporate meetings and the busybodies with very few changes from the original design. This was incredibly forward-thinking, typical of his, his work. It's very futuristic, very space age, very science fiction-y, all the angles, the slab sides, the interesting swage lines going all over the place. But multi most importantly, the fact this is aerodynamic wedge, which he loved to draw. Unlike the Allegro, it didn't wind up with its scuttle being pushed so far up, it became chunky and ugly. It actually only moved a tiny bit from the original conception, and so it's actually a very elegant looking shape. In fact, thanks to that long, sleek front end and slightly overhanging frontal area. Although it was officially known as the ADO 71 internally, it was also known internally as the Anteater. But the bigger thing about this car is the fact that it looks for all the world like one of those newfangled hatchbacks, which are becoming all the rage from the continent. So Harris Mann drew the car as a hatchback. However, management at BL, who were always the best at future forward-thinking decision-making, they decided they already had the Maxi, which is a hatchback, and they certainly didn't want two hatchbacks in the range because that would be decadent and foolish, and it would take market share from the other hatchback they had. If you've got a good feature in one car, you don't want the same good feature in another one. That would be insane. And also, they didn't think that, despite the fact the forthcoming SD1 was going to be a hatchback, buyers in this big executive market were going to like a hatchback, so they decreed it's not going to be a hatchback, even though it looks like one. So, in fact, it is actually a saloon. This wasn't rectified until the early 1980s in the Austin version when it became the ambassador after a fairly significant facelift. Now, speaking of facelifts, BL, BMC, that whole conglomerate, whatever name it was called at any given time, was the king of badge engineering. Now, although the Austin version was where this design originated, with the flat horizontal radiator slats and single trapezoidal headlights, the Wolseley and the Morris got a bit more of a 
old school traditional look with this slight hump in the middle of the bonnet to house, in this case, the more traditional chrome ringed radiator grille with, what you can't miss, the traditional, very traditional, light up Wolseley badge, which is amazing to have. Not a, There are very few other cars which have a light up badge. So if you see that in your mirror, you know what's coming up behind you. And Wolseley's of old did tend to be police cars. So it's a little bit of a giveaway that the good guys were coming after the bad guys. The other thing that differentiates the Wolseley from the Austin is the fact we've got twin headlights here, which gives it, again, another upmarket traditional trait because that's the kind of people they were looking to sell this car to. So under that long anteater nose of a bonnet, and look, it's got hydraulic struts, so we don't have to mess around with a grubby stick to lift the bonnet up. This is extremely posh, it has to be said. We have got the venerable, although it was actually still fairly modern at this point, 2.2 litre E-Series. This is, of course, the engine that had been in the car's predecessor, so this is a very modern thing for this time. Front engine, front wheel drive, transverse layout is still quite an exciting, different, unusual thing. Perhaps a little scary even in 1975. This is 2,229 cc's of power with twin carburetors that makes about 110 horsepower. It may not be the most powerful engine in the world but it is very smooth indeed and this car is all about ride and comfort and being a very nice place to be more so than it would have been about out and out performance. We must remember the market we're selling to here. And one big advantage this car had over its predecessor with this engine is the amount of space you have all around it to work on it because it's a long wide bonnet area. You could probably fit a V8 in here transversely actually. If you need to work on the starter motor or the, anything at all in fact, it's very easy to get a spanner down in there, which is nice for a change. Right, let's climb aboard the wedge and see what it's like inside. And first of all, we would just say, look at these delicious finned alloy wheels on there. Now we've got these pull out metal door handles because it's posh, it's the, it's the fanciest one in the range. We've got full, for the same reason, full door covering. This light brown vinyl leather effect. I see lesser cars in the mid 70s would have definitely have had a body color top bit on the door. Not the Wolsey though, because this is as sumptuous as they come. And what we have in terms of door furniture is a little bit of decoration, molded in stitching to make it look like we've got separate panels and add a bit of poshness and interest. We've got the tiniest little door handle you've ever seen on actually quite a big car. Manual windows because 1970s and Britain. And we've got a fairly sturdy door handle. We even have a door pocket down here as well. Climbing inside, selling point of the Wolseley was the velour, and there is acres and acres of lovely, soft, sumptuous velour. And a selling point again, there was a brochure showing 240 seating positions for the driver's seat. So the back goes forwards, backwards, up and down. You've got the reclining mechanism there, which moves into so many increments. It's 240 different seating positions. So literally anybody should be able to find a comfy spot in here. Now underneath we have got nicely appointed carpets. This has curiously got City Rover, City Rover floor mats in it, which is uh, possibly even rarer than the car itself, which is astonishingly rare. Up in front of us we have got, frankly, epic T-shelfery behind this full width faux air vent. That's quite a clever bit of design just here. We actually have tiny air vents here just popping up, mimicking the front of the bonnet just there this shape here on, on either end of the dashboard. The vents then just pop out there to blow air onto the windows and demist the door, door glass. And we've got lots of ventilation up here keeping the window itself um, ventilated. And curiously, you'll notice how much further down the back of the dashboard is than this. Uh, so there's actually a stuck on black strip on the inside behind underneath where the windscreen wipers sit. That's quite a curious design choice. I'm not sure why they would do that. Meanwhile though, we do have a very good T-shelf area. So fish and chips galore up on there, which we kept nice and warm. If you set the heater on to full defrost, that'll keep your fish and chips toasty while you're waiting to eat them. Moving back down, we have got a very, very vertical cliff face of a dashboard. This is quite American inspired, I might suggest, because American cars of the well the 60s into the 70s did tend to have absolute granite face not granite face quality but certainly granite face look dashboards with everything being very very vertical indeed just a little bit of a curve just there the glove box is lockable but it's also interestingly contoured just there 
That contour continues into this dashboard area, which then has a little cowl over it, so your instruments and switches are all shielded from the sun. This being the Wolseley gets a wooden dashboard. Now after the Wolseley range and brand was deleted, this became the HLS trim level in the Austin, and this wood was known as Canaletto, which is up there with fine Corinthian leather for made up marketing words. Now we have got a proper size radio aperture, so you can fit a fairly modern radio in here. This was a, I'm guessing 1980s radio edition just here. We've got the lighter socket somewhere, I'm guessing there will be an ash crater at the other end of that process. We've got heated controls, no air conditioning because 1970s, we can choose where our ventilation goes. I'm oh, very, very safety conscious indeed. We have got a little flashing light that tells us if we haven't done up our seatbelts. Now, the dials themselves here in the center. We've got a clock instead of a rev counter, this might be the poshest car in the range. We've got a speedometer rising up to 120 miles an hour. And this car's only got a smidge under 36,000 miles, which is phenomenal for a car that's pushing five decades old. And the third dial space, is three little instruments which are in the center area but just segmented into three little small sub segments fuel temperature and battery and scattered around quite neatly arranged actually we've got a pair of little lights up here for lights and main beam and four more lights down here for other things which we hope you've read your user manual for so you know what they're alerting you to to the right hand side we've got a bank of five switches for brake test lights on hazard lights wrist green heater now this is the same switch they stuck or a similar idea to a lot of British Leyland Triumph and so forth cars which does make you wonder about how much faith BL put in their own brakes this would be a fog light switch there should be fog lights in this car but uh, hasn't gotten for some reason this though is one of the most curious switches you're ever going to see and if you can tell me from just looking at that logo what that does I will send you 10 pounds although I've no way of proving it so I'm not going to send you 10 pounds this is because this dashboard is remarkably advanced the lighting isn't immediately behind the dials it's a bulb somewhere hidden in the dashboard elsewhere and there are fiber optics leading up to the back of the instruments and this when the lights are on controls the brightness of the illumination it's a two-stage dashboard light dimmer I uh, bet you didn't know that was a thing now underneath that to go with the lighter it's over there we have got an ashtray slung under here like in a maxi Underneath all of this, we have got a very large sub tea shelf where you can place small items, and that's repeated on the other side. That's where the speakers for that radio are currently living. And we've got big, big air vents. This is, for a 1970s car, these air vents are absolutely massive, it has to be said. And then underneath this area, it is surprisingly blank. You think there might be a few more things or decorations they might have chosen to put down there, but they haven't. It's just a big area of dark plastic, which continues into the center console with a very useful, very large cubby area just there and of course the four-speed manual gearbox there was a three-speed Warg Warner if you really wanted to punish yourself and a proper old mechanical handbrake because 1970s again with more storage tray area around it if you want to use it for that area the seats are quite supportive they're fairly wide but they do have a certain amount of shaping and sculpting to make them comfy and they have a fold-out armrest in each one to give you the proper captain's chair experience. Moving back to the steering wheel, it's a very, very thin rimmed steering wheel, typical 1970s fodder, but we still have another row of cannelloni wood, sorry, cannelletto wood, and the Wolsey logo, very, very finely crafted. You can see it through the clear material, the shape of the wreath and the sculpting of the W. It's quite a fine looking thing. We even have, because it's a car of the 70s, a choke for those dual carburetors, and very small, fine, in in fact, uh, stalks on the left giving us windscreen washers and wipers, on the right giving us indicators, and of course, the horn. Oh, it's a two-tone. It should be a two-tone horn. It's a slightly injured horn. Oh well, maybe we'll get a two-tone out of it later on. Now, climbing into the back of the car, we've got fairly good access through big rear doors, lots of knee room, lots of foot room to climb in. It's quite low because it is a very low slung car, but we've got more than acceptable headroom, lots more velour, we've got very nice velour feeling headlining, we've got illumination in both the C posts, we've got a great big vinyl covered parcel shelf, we've got the same door panel style as in the front, and we've got interesting pressed patterns in the back, you know you're in a fairly upmarket car when they bother to do something with the back of the front seats, rather than just leaving it as plain and cheap as possible. 
We've got enormous footroom. As I say, there's so much space in here, it is just ridiculous. We also have a lighter in the center and both doors have a little pop-out ashtray for a little bit of sweetie wrappers and so forth in there. And we've even got an armrest which rolls down here. So this is exceedingly comfortable. It actually feels like quite a long way to the front of the car, it has to be said. So this is very comfortable indeed. And also lurking in the back of here is Centenary Le Mans. This car did a lap of the, or three laps of the Le Mans circuit a couple of weeks ago. In fact, the same weekend that I was there. So this is a very well-traveled car, despite the low mileage on the odometer. Right, let's get the Wolseley on the road. That doesn't come off. So we'll have to live with the phone holder. Now this car has unfortunately had a bit of a mishap with its gear selector, so finding the gears is a little harder than it should be at the moment. Now this six cylinder is really, really so smooth. <laughs> Quite a loud wipers we got going on just there. Now, as I say, the selling point for this car was the ride, and it is incredibly smooth. Just cruising along here, not going too quickly at the moment, and the car's happy in a comfort zone just here. It's got the Hydra gas suspension, which is an update on the old Hydra Elastic, which gives it a slightly more controlled ride than the original slightly bouncy version that originated back in the minis, back in the uh, end of the 50s. BL were still playing with that at this time. Now, while the Mini might have been a little bit bouncy for that kind of setup, here in the longer wheelbase Princess, well, Wedge, or whatever you want to call it, it works very well indeed. Now, this did give it a proper limousine spec ride, and so this is the kind of car that was bought by, well, fairly well off important people who had places to be that mattered. In fact, Her Majesty's government was apparently a fairly big customer for these cars. And uh, they were in the motor pool for the, the junior minister type grade to, to be driven around in. The bigger fish, of course, were driven around in Rover P5Bs. Now because this was a big luxury fancy car with all the toys, which we are very luxuriously appointed for a car from 1975, we got power steering as standard, we got dual circuit brakes as standard. So things should not go awry at all with a car like this. And although handling is not necessarily a strong point, it does go around a corner very easily indeed. In 1975, Autocar tested the Austin version of this car and they managed to get 0 to 60 in 13 and a half seconds at a top speed of 104, which is pretty decent for a car of its ilk. And that was testing the six cylinder engine, which was really the one to have. The 18 in the 1822 denomination, that referred to the B series, which obviously came out of the MGB amongst many other things. That was quite an old engine at that point. It originated back in 1947, which ancestors had at any rate. But don't forget, that was only 28 years previously. So putting it in perspective, it wasn't that old, but it was significantly less powerful. And you've got a car as big, well, not particularly heavy, but certainly a large vehicle. This is four and a half meters long, don't forget. It's a big, comfortable car. That's a lot of weight for a four-cylinder 1.8 to drag along. Now, of course, only being on sale for such a short time, they didn't get long to sell many of these. The club think that maybe 2,400 approximately were sold. And of that, there are virtually none left. Now, although how many left does suggest there are quite a few around, a lot of those probably don't relate to anything more than a bit of scrap metal and a V5. There are maybe 36 that they know of that are viable cars, but a few of those are sawned, and whether or not those will ever come back on the road is, well, anyone's guess, frankly. Now, 
a very typical BL kind of thing. The size of this car is slightly odd. That's the kind of thing they carried on with the Rover 200 and 400 later on. It's bigger than the Cortina that it was not a rival for, but smaller than the Granada, which it probably was a rival for. And of course, it was priced and specced, certainly to be better than the Granada. So it was always a car that was hard to pitch as a, a competitor to anything in particular because it didn't quite match in terms of size. But in terms of spec, it was one of the most luxurious cars you could buy. We have wood, we only have velour as an option, no other choices for interior. Outside, fog light on the back, alloy wheels, metallic paint was a common option on many of the cars. And of course, that wonderful, smooth six-cylinder engine, which has got that almost BMW-esque growl. Just even a tick over, it's got a lovely, characterful note. And motoring journalists back at the time were enormously complimentary about the car. They really liked the way it rode and handled. And they forgave the fact that it wasn't the fastest car in its class, or any class if it's related to it because it just rode so nice and it was such a nice place to be. No one cared about Nürburgring times back then. How nice was the car? That's what mattered. And the answer was very nice indeed. Now the thing is, the strongest thing about this car was its styling, but that was also its weakest thing because that sharp edge look was very divisive indeed. It's an absolute love or hate Marmite kind of thing. And many people absolutely loved it. It was such a forward-looking, future-thinking style that many people couldn't get enough of it. The problem was, when you got to the more traditional, older buyer, perhaps something as edgy and wedgy as this was a little off-putting for them. But people got past that because it was looking to the future, and that was where things were going back then. The problem was, it wasn't a hatchback, and more and more rivals were becoming hatchbacks. And so when the car was facelifted, it absolutely had to become a hatchback, of course. The Wolsey never got that chance. Now this car has had a small amount of bad luck in the last couple of days. Uh, someone has nudged the back of it causing a little bit of damage to the rear trim, which you may have noticed on the outside shots. And the selector on the gears has just yesterday managed to lose third gear, so we are struggling a little bit. We can still feel how well the car rides, how sharp the steering is, how good the brakes are. And it is a really nice thing to be in. Now this thing replaced the Land Crab, believe it or not, is such a massive jump in generational styling. In terms of styling, there's virtually nothing that links this to the Land Crab before. So this was one of the most interesting and unusual, and sadly in the case of the Wolsey, short-lived cars of the 1970s. It's on a, on a nice, smooth, winding country lane like this. The Hydra gas suspension really is coming into its own. The car's not leaning too badly around the corners. And it's uh, incredibly comfortable going over the undulations and things. They really did work out a brilliant luxury executive car. Now, visibility in this car is really very good considering it's such a low roof line. The car's about 1.4 and a bit meters tall. So you've not got a great deal of depth, but the shoulder is very low indeed, so it's below your own physical shoulder in the car in the driver's seat. And even though you do have that weird high scuttle thing going on, you still have a fantastic view out of the car. It's wonderful. It feels very open and area. The light colours they've used, the cannelloni, sorry, cannelletto wood, makes the thing look very light indeed. Of course, front-wheel drive was really unusual for an executive car in 1975. Big, posh cars were 100% rear-wheel drive back then. So this was a pretty bold move on BL's part, putting this car out. 
I have really enjoyed being out in such an unusual car and I hope you've enjoyed seeing it. If you have, please as always hit like and subscribe and join us next time driving something completely different. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below.